Wow, what a lovely introduction. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Thanks for inviting me. Aaron invited me back in 2015 um, when he heard I was working on this book after seeing a talk that I gave at the Pittsburgh uh, Symposium on Mathematical Programming. And I thought the book could be ready in a year. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha, ready four years later, uh, three years later. Um, so um, thank you for coming. It's a thrill to be here. Um, I hope you enjoy what I'm going to present. Uh, the title of my talk is OptArt, uh, the subtitle, uh, you know, from mathematical optimization to visual design. It's a, a, the book describes a journey I've taken, um, taking what I've learned about optimization in my graduate studies in operations research and then using it to try to design visual artwork. So um, the book is available. It's gotten blurbs from a lot of uh, people I admire a lot. I'm really happy about that. I won't linger on that slide. I want to dive in and I want to give you plenty of opportunity to ask questions. Um, optimization is the branch of math and computer science that deals with optimal performance, trying to do some tasks as well as it can be done. Um, it's an extremely applicable branch of mathematics and computer science as all human beings are optimizers from time to time. Uh, we go out, we run errands, in what order do we do them? That's just one example. Um, I started this whole work to try and convince students that optimization is broadly applicable. Um, and I thought at the time, back in around 2000, what better way to convince uh, people that optimization is broadly applicable um, than to show them that it could be used in an area where they might not suspect that it would have any use at all, visual arts. Um, so, OptArt is a term that I coined myself, a rather arrogant thing to do, um, but I was excited about what I was doing and still am. I, I consider OptArt to be art constructed with uh, math and computer science based techniques. So um, some people, when I, if I'm on a plane ride and coming here and saying, what is it I do, they might think combining mathematics and art is you know, a very strange thing. I, I consider it to be quite natural. Um, for, and I'm going to essentially give a proof of that, um, some statements about optimization from the view of a mathematician. Optimization is one of the best tools we have for managing the many constraints we have that we face in our lives. We all face constraints. It's what makes life hard and what's ma what makes life interesting. What about from the art side? Well, you know, being human beings, all artists face constraints. Uh, if you are painting something to enter into a show, you have to satisfy the rules of entry. Um, if you're working with a certain medium, you have to respect the physical constraints that are involved in working with that medium. It's different painting on canvas than it is painting on paper. What type of ink you use has an impact, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but some artists really embrace constraints so far as to self-impose them. Um, origami is one great example. What can you do with a square piece of paper? and just allow yourself to fold it, nothing else. Um, other examples include uh, pointillism, the work of Seurat. What can you do just using tiny dots of paint? Um, here are a few of my favorite quotes about the benefit of using constraints in art. Uh, from a visual artist, Matisse, much of the beauty that arises in art comes from the struggle an artist wages with his or her or their limited medium. Um, this is from an author, uh, Joseph Heller, wrote Catch-22. He was interviewed by the Paris Review some time ago, tried to uh, paraphrase T.S. Eliot. I haven't found the original T.S. Eliot uh, quote of this, but what Heller said is, when forced to work within a strict framework, the imagination is taxed to its utmost and will produce its richest ideas. I, I believe this to be true. And this one's incredibly inspiring by the great composer Igor Stravinsky. The more, uh, more constraints one imposes, the more one frees oneself of the chains that sh shackle the spirit. Um, that gives me chills. Um, even reading it now, uh, I've seen it so many times. So um, what I'm going to do in this talk is alternate between talking about some quote unquote classical applications of mathematical optimization and then transition into uh, talking about how I've adapted those classical applications to do visual design work. So I'm going to run through something I do whenever I give this talk, and that's uh, talk about what's called by some the linear assignment problem. So this is just a, a toy version of an actual problem that people care about, uh, assigning workers to tasks. 
So the particular optimization task that we're faced with, uh, the particular task, is we've got here five professors. We're just going to call them P1 through P5. They need to teach classes. We'll just call them C1 through C5. Um, so we want to pair up the professors with the classes. We want to ma create a matching. Now, the problem is that if we do a pairing, if we make a pairing, uh, there's going to be some complaining that goes on by the students, by the professors, by the entire community. So these numbers in this table, these are complaint values on a one through five scale. Uh, five means a lot of complaining, one means a very low amount of complaining. Alternately, you could think of these numbers as how many headache tablets the chair of the department is going to have to take in the week following the release of the schedule. There's going to be so much complaining that they're going to have to deal with the headaches that they get over the next week. Um, so, you know, what we, what's our, our goal? You know, if you're the chair, you want to minimize complaining. You, you don't want to deal with as little as possible. Um, how does one do that? Well, you know, here's one solution that's not a good solution at all. You know, professor one with class five, professor two with class four, et cetera. We can add up the complaint values and get a uh, total amount of complaining with this pairings. Um, and it's 16.5 headache tablets. You can all see there's a better way to do this. If you use the diagonal, the main diagonal as opposed to the other one, we can reduce the total amount of complaining to 11.5 tablets. Um, is this the best we can do? How do we go about finding the best way to do this? Well, what I've done here is just show that same solution, that same assignment, that same set of pairings, but I've highlighted what uh, pairings have been made by multiplying them by one, and I've stressed that we're not going to be charged any of the other complaint values by multiplying them with zero. So what we end up getting in the end is a linear combination of these zeros and ones uh, weighted by the complaint values. Or you could think of it the other way. It's a linear combination. The complaint values weighted by the, the ones and zeros. Now, this is a way of getting that 11.5. Um, that we saw in the previous slide. Um, what we're going to do next is replace all these ones and zeros in blue with variables, unknowns, xijs. So we're introducing Boolean zero one variables. Uh, xij is going to be one if we've decided to pair professor i with class j, and zero if we don't. And then the objective is going to be to just add up this linear combination of the variables with the costs as the weights. Um, so we get a linear objective function, a function that we want to minimize. Now, uh, what constraints do we have to put on these xijs? Well, we got to make sure that each professor teaches one class. And there's a simple mathematical way to do this. We just take all the cells that correspond to professor one, add them up, force the total to be one. And we do the same thing for each and every one of the other professors. These quote unquote professor constraints make sure that each professor gets one class. Now we need more. We need to do essentially the same thing, but focusing on the classes. So we're going to take all the variables that correspond to a particular class, class one, add them all up, force that to be one. That ensures that class one receives one professor. Do the same thing for class two, class three, four, and five. So what we have in, in sum is we're minimizing this linear objective function, which is the total amount of complaining, subject to five linear equations that make sure that each professor teaches one class, five linear equations that make sure that each class gets one professor, and then we have 25 uh, constraints that say that all of the xijs are binary, zero or one. This is what's called an integer programming problem, discrete linear optimization problem. Some IPs are very hard. Um, IP in general is, you know, an NP, as a decision problem, is NP complete. Um, optimization forms of IP are NP hard. Um, but this particular instance, this particular IP problem, uh, the linear assignment problem, is easy. Um, there are polynomial time methods for solving it. Um, if we were to forget or, you know, just, well, forget that the XIJs have to be either zero or one and instead you know, allow them to be anything between zero and one. If we were to relax the problem and feed that into a, a linear optimization solver, what we'll find is that the variables end up being 
binary anyway. So it's, it's, it's a really lovely structure to have in this problem. We can solve these very quickly. Incidentally, if you cared, if anyone cared about this toy instance, this is the optimal solution. OK, now on to some art that's done along the same lines. So um, this is an example of what's known as domino artwork. This is a mosaic made out of three complete, complete sets of double line dominoes. This is done in the style of Ken Knowlton, who's really the father figure um, of this type of work. He's the first person, to my knowledge, that made domino mosaics. Um, when I was a student about to graduate from high school in 1981, Omni Magazine put out um, an issue that had in its games column, uh, uh, basically, it, it, th that column was devoted to the artwork of Ken Knowlton, these domino mosaics. And I saw this as a high school student, and I said, wow, this is really cool. And I had no idea how he did it. And then four years later, I was about to graduate from Oberlin College. Omni came out, coincidentally, with another issue that had a games column devoted to the work of Ken Knowlton. And again, I thought, this is really cool. I don't know how to do it. But then after grad school, I was looking for material for my optimization class at, uh, um, at Oberlin. I was digging through Mud Library at Oberlin in the stacks, and I found this book that was uh, a report of a Gathering for Gardner conference in honor of Martin Gardner. And the back of that book had a portrait of Martin Gardner done in, I believe, nine complete sets of double nine dominoes. And at that moment, with the optimization training I had in grad school, I said, oh, I know how to do this. It wasn't the same way that Ken Knowlton did it. He is a computer scientist. He used kind of what we would describe as heuristic techniques. I saw a way of creating a discrete linear optimization problem, an integer program, to do this. So you know, I'm in debt to Ken Knowlton. If I hadn't seen his work, I wouldn't have been doing all of this. I wouldn't have had all this much fun. So what we do here is we take an image, a target image, I'll call it. This one is Boris Karloff as Frankenstein's monster. I believe this is from uh, the film Bride of Frankenstein. This is a public domain publicity photo. I've chopped it into squares. There's 22 rows, 15 columns. 22 times 15 is 330, which is the right number of squares to have if you're using uh, three complete sets of dominoes. Each complete set of domino has 55 dominoes in it. Each domino has two halves, so the area covered by one set is 110. Three times 110 gives us the 330 that we need here. Um, there's some preliminary, preliminary work that I do with this. What I do is I go ahead and uh, basically average the pixels in each square and convert their grayscale values, the, the average grayscale value, to something between 0 and 9. 0 and 9 because I'm using double nine dominoes that have anywhere from 0 dots on one of their squares to 9 dots. 9 being as bright as you can get, uh, 0 being as dark as you can get. So I'm going to go back and forth a couple times. If you focus on the forehead, that's the brightest section. You can see that corresponds to the cells that have nines in them. If you focus on the zeros down at the bottom, and then if I go back, you'll see that's the darkest section. So zero through nine, zero is black, nine is white. In between values are various shades of gray, brighter as you go up. All right, so you've got this. What do you do next? Well, the next step is to lay dominoes down on top of pairs of squares. So in a way, you're matching dominoes to pairs of squares. You're assigning dominoes. And I'm using that language to remind us of this uh, problem that we talked about earlier, this professor class assignment problem, because we're doing something similar. This is the full thing again. Um, as I've already said, there are 55 dominoes in a set. When you place them down to form one of these domino mosaics, typically people do this with the dominoes positioned either uh, vertically or horizontally. I've done some where everything's at a diagonal. Um, it turns out that complicates things a little bit for kind of complicated reasons. Um, but if I'm placing something down vertically, um, well, or, or horizontally, it, you know, how many specific ways I have to do it depends on whether it's a double domino or a non-double. If it's a double domino like the 5-5 five, five here, I just have two choices, vertical or horizontal. If it's a non-double, uh, the number of choices doubles. Okay. Because the lower numbered square could be on you know, top, bottom, left, right. So think back to the professor class assignment problem. We had variables xij. xij was 1 if professor i was paired with class j. We've got something similar here, but it looks horrendous at first because it has five subscripts. Uh, you can condense this a bit, but for our purposes, this will work. xmn 
OIJ will be 1 if domino MN, we need two numbers to specify which domino we're talking about, is placed or in orientation O. The O could be vertical or horizontal or a variation of vertical or horizontal. Um, and we need to say where it's going to go. So uh, the IJ tells us what square of the board the, is going to be affected, the top left square that's going to be affected. So given an, an example, I've used the 3-3 three, three domino here. I placed it vertically. The top left square of the board covers uh, cell 1, 1. So I have just set the variable x3, 3, 3, v, 1, 1 equal to 1. Here is an alternate. This would be setting x3, 3, 3, h, 1, 1 equal to 1. Now, if I make a placement like this, how good a placement was it? I need a way of evaluating. I need a, something equivalent to the cost of people complaining about a professor class pairing. So essentially what we want to do is compare the leftmost three with the two and the rightmost three with the five. And you could do a sum of the absolute values of the differences. That was the first thing I tried. It doesn't work out quite as well as doing this sum of squares idea. So the cost of placing this 3-3 three, three horizontally in this way is, ends up being 5 by one way of measuring it. Um, if I did something a little bit different and do the vertical, the cost is better. I want to emphasize that I'm going to be using complete sets of dominoes. If I had an unlimited supply of dominoes, I could get this so that the total cost would be 0. And that just doesn't interest me as an optimization person. OK, so where, where are we? What do we have? We have. Um, total cost of placing the dominoes as being this linear combination of the variables where the weights are these costs, just the same as we had with the professor class assignment problem. So a linear objective function. We, it turns out, have constraints that are very similar to the constraints for that um, linear assignment problem, the professor class assignment problem as well. If we think of a domino as a professor, um, you know, it's really the same thing. Um, add up all the variables that correspond to domino MN, Know, all of these XMN and OIJs for a fixed MN and force the sum of those variables to be the total number of sets that you're going to be working with. For the Frankenstein example, Frankenstein's monster example, would be S would be 3. And then what's going to be playing the role of the classes? If the dominoes are playing the role of the professors, the classes are going to be the inv individual squares of the board. And mathematically, this is a little bit of a pain to write down. You have to define a set PIJ that's the set of all these quintuples, M, N, O, I prime, J prime, that cover a particular square of the board. So if we have a square here, we could cover it vertically, vertically, horizontally, horizontally, over all possible M's and N's. Just add up all the variables for that and make it be one. This will ensure that each square of the board, each square of your mosaic, will have something in it. In fact, we'll have exactly one thing in it. We don't want any gaps. We don't want any dominoes overlapping anything else. So this is another integer programming problem. It seems very similar to the linear assignment problem. I've tried to stress that it is similar. It's a little bit different. Um, if we had chosen, let's say, a certain collection of uh, slots to hold dominoes and said, hey, when we do this problem, we're going to use those particular slots. If we're going to partition the board ahead of time into domino size regions, then this would be a linear assignment problem. But because we don't have that partition ahead of time, it's a little harder. Um, but most of the time when we solve this, it, it takes very little time for a, a good optimization solver. Often the relaxation um, yields an in, a integer valued solution, um, as is guaranteed in the linear assignment problem. Um, if that's not the case, usually a, a very small branch and bound tree is needed. So even the large ones that I'm going to show you uh, take very little time. All right, so this was the three set one for um, Frankenstein's monster. Uh, it was Martin Luther King birthday, Martin Luther King Day on Monday, uh, let's see, 18 years ago. I did this with a group of students at Oberlin in what was called the open room there. It was a combined first and second grade class, uh, 12 complete sets of dominoes. This, this uh, domino mosaic was made by the kids. They placed them down, they glued them. If you get up close to it, it's a real mess. Um, they're all kind of wonky and there's but from a distance, it looks very much like what we have. That's my son um, um, up, up there with me. Um, I've put plans for this up online. Um, I have a website, dominoartwork.com. I uh, put the plans for this up for free, PDF format. If you ever want to work with a school, um, it's a really fun activity. 
Um, you should read the advice that I give about the types of glue to use and the types of backing to use. Um, I, I will just tell you that. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's been done all over the country. This was in San Francisco, um, maybe a couple years after uh, I did it in Oberlin. A few pictures of that. This is one that I did um, myself. It's the largest one I've ever done. This was done for the International Symposium of Mathematical Programming in Copenhagen, 2003. Uh, it's of the Danish graph theorist, uh, Julius Peterson. So if, if there are any fans of the Peterson graph, this is an image of the Peterson who discovered slash invented it, how, however you see that. Um, this was a challenge to get to Copenhagen. I, I did this in 48 small panels. I glued the uh, dominoes to these um, basically linoleum with a, you know, a thing you could peel off that had sticky stuff on the back. Um, so I had to bring these 48 panels. Um, and I decided, well, I don't want to put it underneath the plane and risk it being lost. So I brought them on carry-on luggage. And it was really, really heavy. So I probably looked like I was you know, carrying some illegal substances through the airport the way I was sweating. Um, I flew from Cleveland to Toronto to Copenhagen. Um, when I so I had to go through security checkpoints both in the US and Canada. In the US, basically they have this giant block of wood going through. They freaked out. They did a test, you know, a swab. It set off some alarm and, you know, I had to have my passport number written down and be interrogated. Um, uh, when I got to Canada, it passed through. The guy took a start. He said, what's that? I said, oh, it's a domino mosaic. And he goes, cool, and gives me a thumbs up. <laughs> so. You know, th that was interesting. Um, this is the largest one I've ever done. It's the largest one I will ever do. Um, this is one that I didn't build. I designed the mosaic. This is 44 complete sets of dominoes. Um, this was done by uh, children at Franklin Elementary School in Massachusetts under the direction of uh, Julian Flaron, a professor at Westfield State University in Massachusetts. And they worked on this for quite a while. This was right after uh, Barack Obama was inaugurated, our 44th president. That's why we use 44 sets. Um, and they incorporated this into their math, into their art, into their social studies at that school. Um, and I think the kids had a great time. Um, if you want to find more, I, I've been dying to use this phrase, you can Google the word <laughs> Obaminos, which I, I'm, I always love using the word obaminos, um, but that's, that's what uh, Julian and his team decided to, to label this project, obaminos. So if you Google obaminos, you'll find a really lovely uh, collection of web pages that describe this entire thing um, if you wanted to do this yourself. So I knew that Julian was doing this. I, I didn't know that anyone else had done it, but I was contacted by a mother of a child who had to go into treatments at the Detroit Children's Hospital regularly. And she emailed me and said, um, you know, Professor Bosch, I just wanted to let you know that you know, we love seeing your domino mosaic at the Detroit Children's Museum um, every time my daughter goes in. And I was like, wow, that's great. I didn't know that there was one there. Um, so I reached out to them. And I went there in 2016. And you know, they gave me a tour, treated me great, and showed me the full thing. Um, this, this portrait that's hanging there, in on the wall not too far from the hospital cafeteria was assembled by kids who were in the hospital in summer of 2009. All these kids were being treated for HIV. Um, they, the people in the staff were looking for something to keep their mind off of what they were going through. And I was told that the children really enjoyed doing this. So that, that made me feel really good. Um, yeah, so um, at this point, a little bit of a digression from what I've been talking about. Everything I've talked about so far has been in this book that I'm plugging and that I'll be selling and, and signing if you are interested. Um, what I'm presenting in the next couple slides is something that's new work that's uh, you know, a continuation of the work in the book. And it's really best described as domino steganography. This is done with a uh, recently graduated Overland student, Aaron Kreiner. Um, and this is an attempt to hide one image inside another image. So it's a form of visual cryptography. So what we see here are two rather low quality for me um, domino mosaics of Frankenstein's monster. Um, these are both made out of you know, 48 complete sets of dominoes. Now recall that all the dominoes are placed down either vertically or horizontally. 
Imagine here that someone glued down all the vertical ones, but they forgot to glue down the horizontal ones. And imagine that this thing tipped forward, so all the horizontal ones fell off. Okay. So the one on the left, um, all the verticals form an image of Dracula. The one on the right, all, when all the horizontals fall off, the vertical ones form the image of the mummy. So it's a, it's a way of hiding one inside the other. Um, the optimization model that was required to do this, um, you know, so it's essentially a two-stage process, figure out how to best render your uh, secondary image, Dracula or the mummy, using you know, a very tight set of constraints. I have an unlimited supply of black dominoes, but I can only place them vertically. I have an unlimited supply of white dominoes. I can only place them horizontally. How closely can I uh, replicate you know, one of these two target images? You've, you work on that problem. You get a solution to that. And then you have a partition of your board into domino size regions, and then a single um, solve a linear uh, assignment problem will produce you know, this on top of it. You know, it doesn't look as good as if you solve you know, the full thing at once, but you know, it's a way of hiding one image inside the other. Okay, end of digression. Let me give you a second application of, you know, classical application of optimization, my favorite application of optimization. I'm gonna run through this quickly in the interest of time. Uh, traveling salesperson problem. Um, so you have all undoubtedly seen this, so I'll go quick. The goal is given a collection of points to find the best tour through those points. So a tour is just a loop. You start at one place, visit all the others, return to where you started. Want to minimize the total distance traveled, minimize the tour length. Um, for a mathematical programming linear optimization type framework, the unknowns here are of this form. X, I, J is, I and J both stand for points. So I and J, X, I, J is going to be one if points I and J are adjacent in the tour if they're visited consecutively by the salesperson. And incidentally, this is a symmetric version of the problem. The salesperson could go around this clockwise or counterclockwise. As far as total distance traveled, it doesn't matter at all. So here in this tour, uh, points two and three are visited consecutively. So X2, 13 is one. Points nine and 12 are not visited consecutively. So X9, 12 would be zero and so on. And the objective function would be to minimize the total length. Um, that's a linear combination of the variables with the, the distances uh, usually rounded to integers as the, as the weights. Um, this is an example of a tour, and this uh, diagram is shown to um, remind us of, or give us a good idea of what some of the constraints must be. Uh, there's kind of local constraints for the TSP. Um, if you focus in on any one of the points, uh, it has to be uh, visited or touched or uh, you know, incident to two edges. These are known as degree constraints. There essentially has to be a way in and a way out. But that's not enough. This satisfies the degree constraints, but unless you can teleport, there's no way to go from one quote unquote subtour to another. This has subtours. But there are linear constraints we can add to eliminate these subtours. So there's, uh, you know, this diagram shows that. We've got a big blob that consists of all the points in the subtour on the left. If we find all the line segments, the edges that go from that to the outside, uh, we have to make sure that there's a way in and a way out of that blob. So we have to use at least two of those edges. So whenever a subtour pops up, we can start off with no subtour elimination constraints. If then we can see if there's any subtours. If we find them, we can put in a constraint to break those subtours. These are called subtour elimination constraints. And there is great software that uses these ideas. And uh, David Applegate here is one of the uh, driving forces behind that a team. You know that David and Bixby and Fatal and Cook, uh, you know, made up. And their their work is stunning. And I'm greatly in in your debt, David, uh, for that. Um, so I'm going to present some examples of what I call TSP art. So um, you know the example that I showed before that tour that we saw, it kind of looks like a dog to me, you know, kind of in the same way that a few stars look like, you know, 
They have names for constellations, Orion the Hunter or whatever. Um, so if we arrange the points differently, can we you know, produce other things that you know, maybe closely resemble other images? So I, I, I decided here to arrange points so that they would form the likeness of certain emojis. So on the left here, you see the emoji where the emoji is smiling and wearing sunglasses. The one on the right is the, what, nervous emoji, gritting their teeth. I don't know how these are described. Um, in any case, we can view each of these as an instance of the TSP, use Concord, thanks to David et al., and we get a continuous line version of this. Uh, so a single loop that passes through all the points returns to where it started. It doesn't cross itself at all. I call these optimojis. Um, it really hasn't caught on yet, but maybe, <laughs> maybe it will. Um, here's another example. These were both, all these four examples, 1,024 points on my laptop, which is about five years old. Um, using Concord, it takes about, on average, about six, seven, eight minutes to find these. Um, here's one with four times as many points. This forms the likeness of William Rowan Hamilton, Irish mathematician, um, for whom the term Hamiltonian cycle uh, is named. So this is, these TSP tours are Hamiltonian cycles on a complete graph. So this is a Hamiltonian cycle portrait of Hamilton. And you saw these in animated form as the talk started, before the talk started. And this, that's another Hamiltonian cycle portrait of a Hamilton. This is Linda Hamilton, the actress who played Sarah Connor in The Terminator and Terminator 2, and the most recent one, which is actually quite good. Um, and I had to do one more. Um, this is Lin-Manuel Miranda, who played uh, Alexander Hamilton in <laughs> Hamilton. I was not going to miss my shot. Ha, ha, ha. OK. Um, each of these took days to solve on my laptop. But these are all optimal tours. Um, it's, I, I think it's important when you're talking, when I'm talking to people who don't have nearly as much background as you do to stress to them, you know, they may have heard, you know, the TSP is MP hard, and some of them get the impression, oh, that means we can't solve it. Well, you know, you can solve really large instances of the TSP. Uh, so um, I, I do this to help uh, the world understand NP hard a little bit better. Um, actually, if we put more effort into it and we select our images um, carefully, we can produce things that I think have some images that have some artwork that has some emotional heft to it. So here's a collection of 3,072 points that look like a section of the Sistine Chapel, the creation scene done by Michelangelo. And when you connect it, I, I think here this is more powerful than the, the dot pattern. Um, one might see this from a distance and see Adam's hand as God's hand as, hand as being separate from each other, each other. But if you look at it up close and see that it's a continuous line that forms the whole thing, you might say, ah, the artist is saying that God and man are connected. Ooh, something like that. Um, this one is done in homage to Escher. You know, you've got the Escher famous piece where one hand is drawing the other. Um, so this isn't really the self-referential aspect of Escher. It's just the hand that I'm referring to. But I, I designed this to try and, in a single image, get the idea about what this TSPR art is all about. Um, we've got 1,640 dots and then an optimal tour via Concord. I didn't draw every edge segment. I didn't connect all the dots here. I titled this piece, uh, the X, um, the, let's see, the completion of the tour is left as an exercise to the reader, something like that. Um, this is important to me. This was 10,000 dots. This is not a provably optimal tour. It's almost certainly not optimal. This is based on an image that was taken in the last year of my father's life. He was the big one on the teeter-totter. That's me when I was age five. Um, so this asserts to me that you know, we're still connected. I have this made on canvas about five feet across, three something feet high in, in my house. Uh, you know, it's just, I, I, I like it a lot. Um, this one was commissioned by Bill Cook, part of the team that David and, uh, is inv was involved with, uh, you know, this Concord team. Uh, Bill wanted to have a collection of TSP instances for researchers to work on. So I created six of them based on famous works of art um, with 100,000 points, 100, 120,000, all the way up to 200,000. This is the smallest of them um, based on a section of Leonardo's Mona Lisa. Um, and this was released to the public 
This was unveiled this instance in 2009, and very shortly after, Yuichi Nagata from Japan used genetic algorithms to find the tour that's displayed here. And uh, this is just a snapshot of Bill's site for this um, and some information about it. Uh, one thing I want to note on this, the length of Nagata's tour is 5,757,171 distance units. Now, what a distance unit is, you know, it doesn't, it would depend on how, you could scale it this, so that, you know, a distance unit was one millimeter. Um, I, I want to mention that number in uh, the context of the bound that's been found by people using Concord and solving various very sophisticated linear optimization relaxations. Um, you know, it might be that Nagata's tour is optimal. It might be that it's not optimal. But if it's not optimal, the, um, if there is a better tour, it's not better than Nagata's tour by more than 107 distance units. So think about 107 compared to 5.7 million. They've made tremendous progress on that. But I still think that maybe they're years away from getting a, an approvably optimal solution to this. Um, I'm hoping that happens. Uh, I think there'll be some attention to this, and I might benefit from that in some ways. But I just once you know you put a problem out there, you want it solved. That's that's the bigger drive. Okay, some variations. Um, I've spent a lot of time using various images here. One of them is a uh, you know a lot of them are Celtic knot based things. Um, I've also done images where I've had to throw in side constraints. Um, in addition to the usual ones used in a TSP formulation, in addition to the degree constraints and subtorque constraints, um, I might want to force the tour to wind its way through the points in such a way that certain pairs of city-free regions are on the same side of the tour, and certain pairs are on opposite sides of the tour. So these side constraints enabled me to construct this, where you see a red fish-like figure that's on the inside of the tour and a black fish-like figure that's actually on the outside of the tour. Second example of this, um, I call this piece outside ring. Um, that ring in the center, that circle, is actually on the outside of the tour. You could pick any point in black and kind of in a maze-like fashion find your way out to what most people would think of as the outside, the border of the square. Um, you can also, when you lay down the points, you can make sure that you have rotational symmetry, for example. So the dot pattern that was used to construct this embrace sculpture, um, the dot pattern had six-fold rotational symmetry. And then when I solved the TSP, I forced the tour to have three-fold rotational symmetry. And that gave rise to what's known as color swap or color exchange symmetry. So when I look at this, I see certain like snake heads that you know, are surrounded by stuff from another material. I see like a... A, a goldish or brass snake head surrounded by stainless steel. I, then if I rotate a little bit, 60 degrees, I see a stainless steel snake head surrounded by brass and so on. So that's what I mean by the color exchange symmetry. And this piece was made with a computer controlled laser, uh, computer controlled water jet cutter. So you start with an eight, uh, eight inch diameter disc of steel, um, quarter inch thick. You have the water jet cutter follow the tour, the optimal tour for the uh, TSP. And what that water jet cutter does is it serves as a very high-tech cookie cutter. You wouldn't use this with cookie dough. The water jet would blow the cookie dough all over the place. But it separates the sheet of dough into the inside, the cookie, and the outside, the scrap dough. So what we see here is uh, the stainless steel cookie inside the scrap dough from the brass. So when you do this, if you do it with two different metals, you get two different sculptures for the price of two. Um, <laughs> Here's just another view after I restored this image after many years. You can do the same thing with laser cutters and um, various particle boards. Here the light stuff is uh, MDF. The dark stuff is hardboard. Here's just the, the scrap dough MDF. Here's the hardboard cookie. Here's the uh, hardboard cookie rotated 60 degrees. And you can see how the symmetry is helping produce the color change symmetry displayed here. OK, um, I'm almost done. I just have one little variation on the TSP stuff that came out of work that I did at Oberlin with Tom Wexler. He used to be at Oberlin and now works at Google in the Boston office. So um, it's related to this idea of trying to render images using just a single loop. Uh, but instead of 
working with a complete graph, we're going to work with a graph where you know, the edge set is much smaller. So the graph that we see here is what I call a king knight chessboard graph. Um, it's not your standard 8x8 chessboard. It's a bigger one. Each vertex is uh, you know, a square of the board. And then the edges, the lines, are the moves that we're allowing. So it's all the moves that's all, that a, a chess king could do, you know, the horizontal, vertical, or diagonal, plus all the moves that a knight could do, those knight moves that have distance like root 5. So if we just use these edges, what can we do? Can we get something that looks recognizable? Um, Tom made the very good point with TSP art that the positioning of the points is really what is most important. And um, you don't really need an optimal solution to get something that's recognizable. You could be you know, maybe 10% away from optimal and still have it look pretty good. Even if you're like 30% away from optimal, it doesn't look good. So the points are doing all the work. What if you try and make the edges, the line segments, do all the work? So I'm going to just give some examples and not talk about the models at all. Um, this is a Hamiltonian cycle that looks like the letter H. Uh, I'll zoom back in just a second. This is an Eulerian, a connected Eulerian subgraph that looks like the letter E. This is a spanning tree that looks like the letter T. So we got H for Hamiltonian, E for Eulerian, T for tree. Um, which of these is best? Well, here's the same smiley face emoji with the sunglasses in each form. Uh, Hamiltonian, Eulerian, tree. Um, I don't know. They're, they all look sort of good. You know, none of them are as good as the, the TSP art versions, but you know, they're all recognizable. Um, why did I do these? Well, as you might have seen, I, I, I like to make puns. Um, it's been said that the pun is the lowest form of wit, and as a mathematical optimizer, this is a challenge for me. <laughs> How low can I go? Uh, so. I'm going to present and conclude the talk with a collection of puns, all visual, all extremely computationally intensive. Um, I think these are perhaps the most computationally intensive puns ever made. Um, and you can, with all the resources you have, try and you know, end that record that I claim that I have. Um, so again, I've got to start with those same Hamiltonian cycles. These don't look as good as what I had before, but remember how severe the constraints are. Every one of these is a Hamiltonian cycle just with edges from that King Knight chessboard graph. So William Rowan Hamilton, Linda Hamilton, Lynn manuel Miranda is Alexander Hamilton. So those are the puns for the Hamiltonian cycle. Four spanning tree puns. They're progressively worse, so brace yourselves. Um, a tree emoji, the deciduous tree emoji. Arthur Cayley proves some stuff about trees. Um, what, n to the n minus 2 trees? Baby Groot. We have to get back for this to make it work. And Ash Williams from the Evil Dead. The only connection with trees here is that Ash is the name of a tree. So I apologize particularly intensely for that one. Those are all four of them together. And then the concluding pun is an Eulerian pun. Um, we've all heard of the Königsberg Bridge problem. We know it's not possible to take a walk that crosses each of these bridges once and only once and returns to where you started because each landmass um, is incident to an odd number of bridges. But if you zoom into this and look at every single node in my graph, it, everything has even degree and it's connected. So I have an Eulerian uh, circuit that looks like the Königsberg Bridge problem. All right. I don't have to explain the joke to you. <laughs> Yeah. So you mentioned that you solved it with uh, quadratic, uh, basically, uh, uh, least square. Uh, so what was the difficulty you had with the uh, absolute value sum of the well, object function? Well, it's, you know, why do some people use least, you know, sum of squares as opposed to absolute values? It, 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 it's all about how you think of errors. Um, you know, if, if you think being off by two is, you know, twice as bad as being off by one, then you're going to use absolute values. If you think being off by two is you know, four times as bad as being off by one, then you know, the sum of squares idea is. So if, if you're kind of aggressive in how you treat errors, you're going to want to use something other than absolute values. And I've experimented with other norms, too. I didn't see, like, if I use a four norm instead of a two norm, um, it, it doesn't, it's not noticeably different. So I, I stuck with the, the two norm. Sure. Yes. Thanks for the talk. Very Thank interesting you. and very cool stuff. Uh, my question, my question is like, how does the art people think about your art? 
um, it, you know, well, I report that, um, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of live in this weird niche math art world, and there's conferences for this. There's the Bridges Conference series that takes place um, every summer. Um, I've been involved with that. I am going to be involved uh, this summer. It's going to be in Helsinki. You're, in, you're encouraged to submit papers if you do mathematical artwork. Um, there are long papers, which are pa papers that are six to eight pages in length. Um, are due by February 1st. Short papers, which are either two or four pages, those are due by March 1st. Um, I would be eager to see any submissions from any of you all or, or friends of yours. I'm, I'm handling the short papers session. I'm editing that. Um, so in that community, I you know I think you know people like and respect my work. Um, you know, as far as serious fine artists, I, I really don't know. I get along quite well with the artists um, in at Oberlin College. Um, but that's a small sample. Yeah, so I, I have no way of knowing. <laughs> Occasionally people ask me, are you an artist as opposed to a mathematician? That makes me feel good about the art side of it. <laughs> yes. I noticed that um, in your TSP diagrams, the thickness of the lines was not, didn't look constant. Oh, is, you, is, you, that, is that really the case? You, 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 you caught that. Visual? You caught that. So for some of the ones that I do, the first ones that I used to do, I would make the thickness of the lines uniform. And I still do some like that. To get the, like, ones with um, a, a rather small amount of cities, 1,024, 4,096, to really bring out the image in you know, a very satisfying way, it helps to vary the thickness of the lines in accordance with the underlying image. So yeah, um, basically, you, know, you have a dot for every single point. You can make the, the radius of that dot depend on how dark the underlying image is there, and then connect in a way that you know, sort of find quadrilaterals that do that. So is the thickness driven by information in the underlying image, or is it just yes. a function of the length of the line segment? No, it's not at all connected to the length of the line okay. segment. Okay. It's just it's yeah. dependent on if I have a point here and a point here, and this isn't a dark region, maybe that point turns into this big. If this isn't a bright region, it's this big. So how do I connect this to that? We'll just find tangent lines and, yeah, yeah. some computational geometry. Yeah. Which I'm sure I'm not doing in the most sophisticated way, but it works. Yeah.